Hello, everyone. My name is Kate. Hi, I'm Toma. And you're listening to Artwise. I love our music. I think our music is so it's fun. Great. <laughs> Thank you. So today with me, I have an amazing guest, Toma. I'm going to let you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell everybody right. what, what you're all about <laughs> before before we get into the, the interview question. So floor is okay. yours. <laughs> Hi, I'm Toma. I'm a multimedia artist from Amsterdam, mostly working with coming of age analog photography. Awesome. I just want to say, if, if you guys are listening and not watching, she has the most beautiful hair I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> so pretty. Like, the curl. I just, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> so, I have a ton of questions. I've been super excited for this episode. I, I don't know if I've mentioned this, like, during the podcast yet or not, but I was super selective when I picked out guests. I was super selective when I picked out guests this season. So I am excited for every guest episode. Um, usually, uh, I'm going to be honest, in, in years past, or not years past, see, well, I guess years past too, in seasons past, I just kind of like, if you applied, I just like invited everyone, but I was actually pretty selective uh, with the guests this season. So just because we're also doing like the history episodes and the art news episodes. So I, I've been super excited um, for this one. So I did want to ask, because nobody gets away from this question on ArtWise, as I'm sure you've heard from, from past episodes, is how, how did you begin your art journey? What got you started with photography? What got you into it? It's a long story. <laughs> so We have an hour, so take your time. <laughs> when I was, I believe, 10 or even 9, I found YouTube. And that was mm -hmm. the beginning of the blogging, blogging industry. Like everything just started. I discovered like the, the things that I never saw before on TV or in movies where somebody is actually playing like your friend on camera. That was so cool. And I decided to start my own YouTube channel and I just filmed everything in my life, like the vacations with my parents, my friends, like everything. I put it online. And when I was 12, I went to middle school. And then I thought that my old YouTube channel isn't cool. So I deleted it. And I it, I'd regret it very much because I had 10,000 followers. And for that time, that was a lot. That was actually a lot. <laughs> Oh my so, gosh. Yes. And uh, at school, at my elementary school, everybody knew that I'm the girl with the GoPro camera who's always walking with a camera. And when I got to the middle school, uh, I'm from the Netherlands. And when you go to the middle school, it's an other school building. You go with other people to school. I deleted my YouTube channel and I just stopped talking about it. Just for a long period of time. It, it, it was just... I was really like thinking that I'm not cool with a YouTube channel anymore because everybody has social media, everybody knows what YouTube is. So I deleted my channel and after a year I thought that maybe I should like come back and still be cool and filming like beauty videos or something. And I did that, but I did that with another name and just like being another person because I didn't want anybody at school finding out that I have a YouTube channel right now because at that moment it was 2016 it wasn't cool anymore because like YouTube channels past time but in after a year two guys at my school found my YouTube channel where I was acting like another person I just had an other name and that that was it and I was just telling my stories and just filming myself on camera but just another name they started bullying me it was difficult because i was 14 at that time and for a year i was just like actually scared of going to school and because i knew that they they will start bullying me so after some time passed i deleted my youtube channel not because they were bullying me but because i didn't like it anymore it was just like Nah, it, it was like work because I was, because I was every weekend I was recording something. So for a time after that, I didn't have any hobbies like uh, drawing. I did drawing, but not with video making or something. And then 
I, I knew it. It was May and I found my mother's photography camera, an old Nikon. And I went with my mother to um, like shopping and I just brought this camera with me and I was photographing everything. And I was like, oh my God, this is a big camera and I'm photographing, this is so cool. So <laughs> yeah, I just started to photograph everything I saw with this big camera. And um, I've created that May 2018 web page on a Russian social media website uh, where I posted everything I did. So all the pictures and it, it was a, like a big archive. And yeah, so it was really cool. And afterwards, I found a girl who was photo photographing everything for Instagram in the Tumblr wipe with colors, with pink sunsets and sunrises. Everything was so cool. It was like the teenage gaze. And I was like, I should do that too. I like that. <laughs> so uh, I just started to use Photoshop, learn about it. And that's how like four years passed. I, I think so. Yeah, it, it was like four, three years. I did that with only a digital camera. After the second year of my photography journey, I went to a photography academy in Amsterdam. A, a really fun story how I got there, but it was a real academy. It was like a university and I was 15 and I got there because of a like analytics fault on their website. But that's that's another thing. <laughs> uh, I did the photography academy for a year. I got into the Exton program that was a one year uh, academy journey. And that was really cool. And afterwards, I started trying analog methods like analog photography, 35 millimeter film, 120 millimeter film, just everything with film. And I just kept doing that. And afterwards, I started filming again, making short videos for Instagram, short movies, short films, also with film cameras, with cinematic cameras. And now it's 2023. So it's been five years since I've started my photography journey. That's in incredible. <laughs> first, first off, I just want to say I feel I feel you with deleting the YouTube channel. I feel like it's so sad. Like I there are so many things that would probably be like so so much more progressed if like things that I did in like early middle school I didn't stop doing because I was either getting bullied for it or worried about potentially getting bullied mm -hmm. for it like I, I hear so many people have like a similar story. Most of them didn't have 10,000 followers on, on YouTube or 10,000 subscribers on YouTube when they did it, but I definitely didn't. My YouTube channel was for me and me alone with my probably like two su subscribers that were like my middle school friends. But yeah, I definitely, I actually, I still do have my original channel that I had from middle school, I believe, but uh it does not have like any of the old videos. Like I deleted all the videos from it. So I totally understand that one, but that's, that's kind of crazy. So you, you've just always been like a creative, like from childhood yes, pretty much. I think much. so because um, my background story. So um, I was born in Russia, in Moscow. And when I was four or three years old, my parents were like, we should move out there because it's, it's not the climate that we want to raise our child in. So um, in the beginning of 2000s, my parents started to preparing for a movement. And in 2008, we moved to Amsterdam and I grew up in Amsterdam. I never went to elementary school in Russia, but my grandmothers are there. So we were traveling a lot and every like half year we went to my grandmother's just to say hi to like show that everything is fine and um i was always the girl who was from a foreign country and in russia and in the netherlands because in the netherlands they were like oh she is like from another country she's the five-year-old from another country and the same was in russia so every time i went to a walk with my grandmother in a small village all her friends they were like oh toma how do you like like Europe? How how is Europe? How is the foreign world? <laughs> so that was always a thing and I think my parents they were like when they discovered that I love filming everything on my iPhone. It was the first iPhone, the iPhone 3, I think. 
like the beginning. It was my father's old phone that I got. And they were like, you should film your journey because you are constantly traveling and moving and just tell to the Russians, you can tell about the culture in the Netherlands, Netherlands and in the Netherlands, you can tell your friends about the culture in Russia. And I did that. And that's why it got that big because it was more like a traveler's blog. And I know that somebody actually used my blog to move to Amsterdam. So I oh, think wow. the big people, they also, the adults, they listen to a 10 year old telling that if you go to this shop in Amsterdam, you will find groceries. If you go there, you can find my elementary school. So that was really cool. I, I love that now. But then I thought when I was 12 that it's horrible and it's just disappointing. It's not the thing that I want to bring to the cool kids in the middle school. <laughs> yeah, I I definitely feel like everyone can in some capacity relate, if not exactly like using like YouTube in that way and like using social media in that way, there's something else. I feel like everybody... Everybody that I've spoken to has that, like, <laughs> like I don't know if middle school trauma is the right word, but yeah, I definitely, um, yeah. <laughs> you get so, me. So you put in your application that you've been a part of, of like some really cool exhibits and, and projects. So I was just uh, wondering if you could share some of the most memorable exhibitions or projects that you've been a part of and yes, of kind course. of like what they meant to you in your career as a photographer, artist, person. Mm -hmm. So my first solo exhibition was a big thing for me. It was just like a year, a year from now on back in 2021. It was April. And um, I got a big project that I made for my diploma at high school. It was a photography book, actually. And for that book, me and my parents, we traveled to most part of the East European countries. So we went to Russia, we went to Georgia, for example, to Armenia, like a lot of things we did. And I was always interested in teenage life photography from the earliest moments. So I was trying to connect with people from Gen Z in different cities in those countries. So I met a lot of people through Instagram and I just asked, can I photograph you and like your day? And we went actually to the most abandoned cities. We went to Norilsk, that's a closed city on one of the northern points in Russia. And the city is you, the only thing, way you get to that city is by plane because everybody, just like a city in nature, you get, oh, wow. you have no ways to the other parts of the country there, only by plane or by water, but by water, it will take like a month. So <laughs> it was by plane and you can only get there from a Russian city. So there is no actual plane from Amsterdam to Norilsk or from Paris to Norilsk. It's always Moscow or Varkuta or another city in Russia. And what we, what we knew, but what we didn't expect is that the city is actually closed for foreigners. And you can only get there as a foreigner if you have an invitation from somebody who lives in the city and who invites you officially. And then the person who is inviting you is responsible for you. But me and my mother, we have also Rus Russian citizenship. So we went there by plane. And in the airport of Norilsk, there is like only one room. It's as big as my bedroom. So it's really small. It's only a way through. And there was a man standing and he was checking people who are coming from the plane. And he was checking not if those people like are criminals or something, but he was checking the four screen, like the four screen, the book cover of their passports to check if they are actually from Russia. Because if not, you will go with the same plane back. It's it, it was really like we didn't expect that, that that guy will actually check if you are not from Russia and he will send you back. Because it's a city with mines and where a lot of like things treasures are fined for the russian economy etc and the only thing that people do in norilsk actually adults the only place like the most common place that they work for is mines so mm. they they get like 
bricks and some, several things from the mines and that's the thing what they do they work really hard and the gen z they are working with the like the touristic vibe but it's not a touristic vibe it's like a business trip from for people who are from a big Russian city to get there to check if their minds are good operating and go back. So Gen Z is working at the cafes and restaurants and in hotels for those people. So uh, I met a girl who had a lot of friends with her and we went just for one day through whole Norilsk and they are actually music players and they played at the bus stop at the bus station in Norilsk. They do that every summer. And that girl, she was 18 as me, and that was her last summer in Norilsk. Because mostly Gen Z, they do not have a university there that they want to get into. So people are moving from that city when they are 18 and mostly never coming back because it's that far away. It's like, I think, 4,000 kilometers from Moscow. So it's like just the other part of the world. So they are moving and they come back like one time in three years, possibly if their parents still live there. So uh, that girl, for her, it was also her last summer there. And she showed me the rooftops that they play and they like make music on, the things that they do. It's not a lot of things to do in Norilsk because it's actually just a working city. And they aren't, there are not a lot of people there. So part of the city is abandoned. It's actually abandoned. <laughs> and why I would, would love to go to Nuriels then, um, because Liz Safati, a French photographer, she went there to make a project about Russia in the 90s. And she lived there for quite some time, so a year, I think. And she is a French photographer, so I think she was able to be there by invitation. I, I think so. And um, actually, she made her project in the 90s, and I was there in 2021. So it, the city didn't change at all. It was abandoned in the 90s and it's still abandoned. I found that really like disturbing, I think. And there is polar day and polar night. So the only thing you see in summer is sun that's actually making rounds around the city. And in, in the winter, what's there for nine months, months there's only night. Oh, so wow. Okay. It's, it's an, a nice like a travel experience, but... I would not love to like live there actually for a longer time. So we were there for a week or something. And then we went back to Moscow and we traveled to several other cities. So this project that I made was about Gen Z and their, their life in smaller cities and also Gen Z in bigger cities of Eastern Europe, like Kiev or Moscow. And the films that are made on Netflix about Gen Z in America is based on the generational theory uh, that was created in the 90s about all the gen generations, so millennials, etc. And there, Gen Z is mostly influenced by social media, by internet, by like communications, etc. Et but in Eastern Europe, it's different because in smaller cities, people are more influenced by their traditions, by their families. And what I what I saw in smaller cities is that people actually want to get out of there, and they want to get to a bigger city like St. Petersburg or Moscow or Minsk just to start their educational life and just to work there. But sometimes, in most cases, they do not succeed and they come back to the city and their life is mostly the same as their parents' life was. And that was, that was interesting for me because I traveled in 2021 the whole year through Eastern Europe and a lot of things changed because I follow the characters on Instagram, of course, and we have contacts. So people that I photographed in May, in oh, like in August, they had an other life story. Like it, it was, it was, it, it changed really fast, and I, I, I love that to see that. So it was a big journey for me, and I made a book for my high school about it, a photography book, it was really big. And just to travel through so many countries and to contact so many people my age. <laughs> and yeah, that, that was really cool. And in April last year, I wanted to create an exhibition because the war just started. And I knew that all, their pe all the people's lives have changed a lot, like drama dramatically. And I really wanted to like do something and just show people how it was before. 
and what Gen Z did before the war, because there was life before the war in Ukraine, in Russia, in Belarus, everywhere, there was life. And I think we forget that because now the only thing we hear on the news is that war, war, war. But people from Western Europe, they do not know how it was like before. For them, it's like, okay, war changed everything, but what was everything? So I wanted to show people how it was for teenagers and what they do now. So I also connected with everybody just to check what they are doing now, where they are, if they are safe, etc. Everyone is safe still. So it's okay. <laughs> and I made a big exhibition. Uh, I contacted two <laughs> really gentle, really nice gentlemen in Amsterdam. They have an art therapy gallery at Amsterdam West. And I really enjoyed it because they, they made, they have made a really cool workshop series for people who are feeling lonely. And they, <laughs> they did that at their gallery and that was really cool. And I had the possibility to exhibit there for a weekend because we discussed it for a week. It, it would be too long, that exhibition. And for a weekend, that's ideal because people, people can go in and just see, they can choose which dates, but it's not too long. So you can control the exhibition and it's affordable. It's great. So we did a weekend exhibition and I invited my friends to help me. And every day I was there with a friend doing the bar. We had a bar at the exhibition. I, I think that's amazing with traditional Eastern European food. So with small like pancakes, small pancakes with caviar, uh, etc. cetera. It, it was really, really nice. And I exhibited my work that I worked on for the past year and the short movies I made in Eastern Europe, etc. It was really cool. And afterwards, on Monday after the exhibition, so we just ended, we just like finished it. I saw my friend texted me and she was like, have you seen it? You're on the Amsterdam official website with that exhibition. The exhibition was included in the Amsterdam Art Guide of April 2022 because it was really like people enjoy that and people wanted to learn more about Eastern Europe that time. So I was so excited about it that I got on the Amsterdam website and that's the touristic website that people use to get to know Amsterdam and my temporary exhibition was included there. So I, I was really excited about that. That's amazing. So I do. Are, so you're 19 now? Yes. Wow. Okay. So I, do you think that you'll continue doing work that kind of represents like through the, the eyes of a teenager, even like as you go into adulthood? Or do you think you'll shift focus to like stay with people who are kind of your age? I don't know. I, I thought about it because I really enjoyed the Tumblr kind of 90s gaze of teenagers in different countries. And I thought about it because now uh, I think I'm really sociophobic. I do not know why, but I'm not good at connecting with new people. It's like really scary for me. And it's when I was 10, it was easier. And now I do not want to like meet new people. I don't know why. It's just like with, with time. So now I continue f photographing my friends and the people I have met in the past five years and their lives. So currently I'm a bit shifting my photography themes to the life of the people that I photographed before, because I do documentary photography mostly, and that's a good thing that you can evolve in. And I photographed my friend Julia from the beginning of my photography journey. She was then 15, she's now 21, 21. And when I started to photograph her, it, it was a teenage gaze in, in a small Russian city. It was like the 90s vibe, it was in there. And it her life, it, it evolves really fast. Now she's married, she has a great kid, etc. But it's really cool to see how people, people's lives can change and that you can document it. I always tag my people that I photograph on Instagram, I always tag them in my posts. So people that are watching the pictures, they can find those people and they can look what their actual life is. Yeah, no, I, I was like, as you were, as you were talking about that, too, I was trying to think like for myself, right? Um, because I, I was 19 four years ago, I just turned 23 in December. And 
it did not feel like four years ago. I feel like I still, in a, in a lot of ways, I feel like I still kind of feel like a teenager, but also not like a teenager with more responsibilities. <laughs> like that's, that's kind of how I feel. I don't know if that's like how I'm supposed to feel or, or what, but I also, I do also relate to the whole social thing, connecting with other people. It's part of, I think, really good like parallel to the reasons why I started this podcast because I did want other people to kind of have a platform to tell their stories in a way where like somebody could say I I want to know what it's like to be an artist look for this podcast find it and hear from like 80 different artists all in one place <laughs> and I I've thought a lot about like my childhood because like much like you said when I was younger like eight, nine, 10 years old, it was so easy for me to talk to people. I was a very et extroverted and like naturally very social person. And as I got older, I kind of, I found it a lot more difficult. And I do think it stems back to like bullying. So that's really interesting to hear yeah. somebody has like a similar, because I do think when people so blatantly like not only like they choose to misunderstand you and misunderstand like you as a person and like what your goals are and what you're trying to do as like such a young child, I feel like it really damages like instead of going into situations with new people, there's less of that like childlike curiosity and there's more of like this, this person might misunderstand me and that's really frightening. Yes. But I do think this podcast is kind of helping me grow out of that uh, in a lot of ways. So I don't know, maybe you want to start a podcast. <laughs> that might help. It's a great idea. I think you should. You're very well spoken. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. So another thing that you mentioned in your application, apart from like the whole teenage gaze thing, uh, was themes of like a lack of belonging and you uh, wrote the insider outsider perspective. Um, I'm mm -hmm. curious in, in your words, like how, how does your work explore those themes and that perspective? It's because uh, I moved to another country at an earlier age. So I'm also a bilingual kid. I'm speaking two languages at home at school. And it's, I think because of that, because I never, uh, I, like, I didn't realize that when I was younger, when I was 12, I was like, it's just my life. But when I was 14, I was connecting with teenagers my age, my age in Russia with my grandmother's neighbor, kids, etc. And I did that in the Netherlands, of course, at school. But uh, I discovered that I do not know a lot of things that they are talking about online uh, in Russia, for example, like my friend, he wrote me a message where he was laughing and he wrote like, ha, 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 ha. And I was like, what does that mean? And it's not because like, it not, it's not because that I do not use, use internet, but because for me, that was new because in the Netherlands, we write smileys. We only do that. We don't have like, wa, ha, 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 ha. In, in Russia, you write the A first, then the H, and then so in the Netherlands, you do H, A, etc. So for me, it was like, huh, did you misspell it? It's like this. And he was explaining to me that, no, it's when we laugh, we write this. So every time all those new like internet things came up, I was like, huh, I do not know it because I didn't see it online before. And in the Netherlands, it was the same thing with music, with TV shows, because um, at home, we mostly speak Russian and we are watching like Russian films, uh, films spoken in Russian, etc. And I did not know any like Dutch Netflix series because I didn't watch them. I didn't find them interesting because I still relate to my Eastern European roots. For me, that's easier, that's domestic, etc. So in the Netherlands, when somebody was discussing like a film or, rea or a reality show, when I was 14, I was like, what? Who are those people? Like, I, I do. What are you talking about, guys? I do not know, etc. So every time I didn't belong in the Netherlands and I didn't belong in Russia. But that gave me an opportunity to look to it as an outsider and to photograph people as an outsider. Because when like... For, for example, like Justin Curlin, she's a photographer and she's now in her, I think, 40s. She, she's older and uh, she photographed teenage girls back in the 2000s. 
and she went with them through America. They were um, the girls, they run from home and they were searching for a community and they traveled together with a 30 year old woman. And I do not know how she did that because I think teenagers will not connect that much with an older people. They find it like really difficult. Also, I went to, because I went to a shoot with a guy in Moscow. He is a roof climber and that's the main thing he does. So he gave stools for tourists on the Russian Moscow roofs, the old roofs. And he, he finds a perfect spot for TikToks, Instagram, etc. And I decided to photograph him and his friends because it's really cool where you, when you are 16 and people from China, they find you on Instagram and they say like, can you, can you give us a tour on the rooftops? So I asked Grusha if I could photograph him and his friends. And he was like, yes, sure, let's do it. And I took my mom with me and my mom, she is almost 50. And when a 16 year old, so a teenage girl with like a mother, he was scared. He didn't know what to say. He was like, oh my God, what, what should I like say? Maybe, maybe I should not use some words. Maybe I should do this. Maybe I should do that. So he was immediately, he was scared of her because she's older. He is like, whoa. And a lot of teenagers are. So uh, I think the possibilities of my age are that I can show teenage life and just show the life of my friends with a kind of outsider perspective because I'm still kind of a foreigner everywhere. That's like, that's really, that's really interesting to me. So like, I'm, I'm just thinking about like what you said and I feel like it's really admirable, like how, cause I know a lot of people, if they had, you know, come from that background where they feel like, oh, I don't really, fully belong in either place, I feel like for a lot of teenagers or younger people, that would be really stressful. And uh, you could really like internalize that and it could be really upsetting. But from what you said, it seems like you've put a really positive spin on it and said, no, actually, I can use this to my advantage. And this is actually a really unique perspective that I know that a lot of other people would really want to see. And I think that's amazing. So Props. (laughs) Props. <laughs> <laughs> so something else that I wanted to ask you regarding your your art, your photography, is how can you balance the commercial aspect of art uh, while staying true to your own vision? Well, I do not take any commissions now, even if I, I'm asked or something, I do not take them because I did that when I was younger and I didn't like that because I did a lot of music albums, not a lot, but I did them and I didn't enjoy working with somebody. It was just like, can you like just shift the text two millimeters down, etc. So I was really annoyed and I didn't like that. And I didn't like need any, like, I didn't like the money aspects of art. So for me, it was like, if I got money, oh, great. But if I didn't, like, it's okay. So um, I just started to decline people's offers for some commercial work. And um, I decided, like, hmm, maybe I can do something with selling my art instead of, like, working for somebody to create something for them. So I decided to, like, sell T-shirts and prints and something that's relatable to like touching an art piece in a smaller, not the gallery vibe thing, but a smaller kind of perspective, really handmade things, better like Etsy. So I started a shop at Etsy and it didn't go that well at all because I sold only postcards and I didn't know how to promote it on Instagram. But in 2019, Instagram decided to get the Instagram shopping online. And I thought, this is it. Because I had then it, I had a lot of followers that for me was like, oh my God, it's, it's starting again. I have the YouTube vibes with it. <laughs> so I thought it's a great thing because the mostly people that follow me, they are my age and they also like to create art and they also like to see somebody else creating art. So I thought it could be a great place to sell handmade pieces. So I started an Instagram shop with Facebook commerce, etc., And I started selling pictures, postcards, after I started doing t-shirts and recently some handmade stuff, I have it with me, like lenticular photography prints. 
those are oh, from wow. the 2000s uh where you had like a cat and you do this and he moves. yeah this I is remember. a picture <laughs> that moves and um it's not it, it was a popular thing in the 2000s but it's really expensive to make in a big scale part so those are like made in maximum 20 pieces and they got like pretty popular i i love that so i started to create more and i do also now jewelry it's a positive film inside a like a thing you can hang on your neck or cool. on the room like somewhere so it's just a hanger thing made with original film so i started to do that and i thought that it's a great thing to combine commerce and art if your interns are not to make as much as money as possible because i do not make anything from that shop because the money that gets into the shop it is for the people that help me with the shop for the shop itself web domains etc and for shipping costs i do not include a lot of shipping costs for countries like russia because the shipping costs from the netherlands would be 20 euros minimum for a small thing like this so even a postcard it's like really expensive so i did not include that so for the eastern european countries it's a lot it's a lot cheaper to buy from my shop than for somebody in germany who is actually like the country next door because um i just wanted to encourage people to buy something and not to make as much money as possible because that wouldn't be nice and that is not my intention yeah no i i definitely relate to that i i have like a little etsy shop um, I haven't tried in the Instagram store yet. I know that's like kind of a big thing. I've heard that that's better than Etsy in a lot of ways, so I might have to try it. Um, but yeah, I have I haven't made any money at all because it all just goes right back into the <laughs> into the business. So, um, but I do want like uh, like you said, as an artist, the one of the most important things to me, and I think you'll agree, is is that people are enjoying my art and they get to experience it and have it I think that's really important so that's why I'm like eh I don't need to be a, a millionaire from from this I just I just want to share my work with people and this is so far the best way I found to do it so and I'm sure that'll evolve as well but speaking of, of all of these different ways that you have to make I essentially I guess products out of out of your your work your 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 photography I'm probably not going to pronounce any of this right. I am not a photographer at all, so excuse me. It's okay. But I, I did want to ask about your approach to experimenting with different photographic mediums like a uh, cyanotype. Yes. You did did I pronounce well. it right? Uh, col <laughs> Colidion. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay yes we can do that <laughs> how is it supposed to be pronounced i think collodion but it's written in dutch i, I do not know oh. if it English is the same word uh i, I okay. think so it should be uh, so those are different methods of printing a picture and just producing a picture old methods from like a century ago so for example cyanotypes i i i think you saw it it are the blueprints on t-shirts on everything like i think you saw it made with sun so you can make like you can put a bottle on something and the sun will shine and there will be a bottle print on something that you like under the bottle gotcha so okay that, i've seen that yeah uh collodion are the tin type prints made on glass so um in the 18th century 19th century I, th I think 90 and 18th century, like mo most of them, <laughs> people made photographs with big cameras, actually really big, th those vintage cameras where you put in a glass piece that's actually like, like this. You put in a glass piece, you, you push the button, you count down like a minute, somebody sits there in the sun for a long period of time, then you take that glass piece out and you run to the dark room those red room like and you put yeah. it into a special emulsion to make a picture that it will actually develop on glass and those are methods that i tried but i do not work with it on a permanent basis because they're really expensive 
So uh, when people say like, film photography is so cheap. We did that when I was a kid, like my parents. They, they still think that's cheap. They didn't see the prices for last like photography developments. <laughs> so um, I do a lot of film photography mostly, but I do not do it at home because I do not like to work with chemicals on a long tar time permanent basis. So normally I give my film to a film laboratorium that develops the film role for me. Afterwards, I bring it home and I scan it myself because that's easier to do. And you do not have to have a dark room at your small apartment that you need to check every time if no chemicals are leaking somewhere. So um, I work with film photography, but I like to develop photographs if like sometimes one time a month to an other kind of print like cyanotype. You can use actually the film negative to put it on a paper that you soak into the cyanotype emulsion, put it under the sun, and afterwards you get a small print of your picture. I think that's really cool, so why not? And that's why like, I like to use a lot of different mediums, because some, maybe I will discover something that I like to work with on a permanent basis. So I did that with um, the Super 8 uh, film. It's a cassette film. So actually there is a film roll in a cassette that you put, put into a video camera and you can actually shot videos on a film camera. That's really cool, but that's really expensive. So I do not like to work with it like on a permanent, permanent basis, but I use it to create video projects that I want to show to people because I, I like the film aesthetic wipe and the, the grain. I like to see it also in big movies, for example, Call Me By Your Name. It's fully shot on a film camera with a, an actual film roll inside. And it gives you a really cool, authentic vibe. So I, I also like to do it on like a small domestic home camera to film my friends and documentary projects on it, like a video. So I also do that. But the film photography world, it's, get, it's getting expensive, really expensive with the crisis, with war, with everything. So, for example, in Amsterdam, we have one studio, one film photography studio that develops film on a client basis. So it's like a shop. You come inside and you put your films into an envelope. You give it to them. They will develop it and scan it for you if you want. But the thing is, four years ago, when they, when they did that, they, they they are popular because they are the only shop that does this like this in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, it's a film city. It's like a film photography city, but we have only one laboratorium that actually does this. So um, it was not that expensive. So you could pay like 10 euros maximum for one film roll to get developed, scanned. And maybe you can even buy that film roll for the same amount of money. So 10 euros in general. Now, four years later, you oh yeah and they scanned and developed that in like one day so you had to wait to wait several hours then you were done but now it can take up to two weeks to get your film like scanned to you or just emailed like two weeks and it's now around 50 euros for one roll so you pay more than one euro for each photograph on a film roll and it's getting really expensive so i decided to still develop film at home it's easier or to develop film in countries that i visit because it could be also less expensive for me wow that's that's insane that's like 500 mm percent -hmm. more expensive and you have to wait longer yeah that's crazy okay that's and just... there are no other laboratory laboratories in the, in like Amsterdam that can do this for you. So a lot of photographers in Amsterdam uh, I, that I know, they send their film to like a film lab in, I think it was Italy that they did. And they, it, it's faster because that's, on, that's faster. But I recently I had a really like not a nice situation with film because I went with my friend, with my boyfriend, on a train to the, one of the northern cities to capture the northern lights. And to get there, I had to take several planes after like a train, etc. And I got through a lot of uh, x-rays. And you cannot put your film through an x-ray. And I I didn't take that serious a long time. So I was like, huh, it, it, it will still, somebody at the film lab will 
check it for me, it will still be okay. But this time it went to one scanner in, en- in Amsterdam, three scanners in St. Petersburg, and after two scanners in uh, the train, at the train stations. And afterwards I send it through post, it's like through email, not through email, through mail, to post mail to the lab. And I do not know if at the post they scan it with an x-ray, but it was damaged and all the pictures, they were just gone. And my mother cannot forgive me because I was photographing on an analog camera at the Northern Lights that not a lot of people can see. So <laughs> the, all the Northern Lights pictures, they, they weren't there because when it goes through an x-ray, it the picture gets darker and darker and darker every time. So it didn't get out and I'm happy that my boyfriend shot digitals. So <laughs> I got all the pictures from him, but the thing is all my film was ruined. And also my, the expensive film, the video camera film that I shot a documentary project on, it is also ruined. You cannot watch it because it gets like with the light leaks because of the X-ray, because some images are okay. The other ones are fully with an X-ray. So you see constantly the flashlights in the videos. So. I should probably use like a hard box to safely travel with my film. And like my parents, like yesterday we discussed it at the family dinner and my parents were like, you should probably use a box. Like even your small sister knows that you need to use a box, a metallic box for your film. Even a six year old knows that. And you, come on. Yeah, my parents, they are just mad that I photographed the Northern Lights on film and not on a digital camera. The only photograph that I took on a digital was with my iPhone and that that's it. So all the other pictures there aren't there. So <laughs> That's so traumatic. Oh my goodness. I cannot, uh, I cannot imagine <laughs> losing all, that's, I'm sorry that happened. That's horrible. 100 <laughs> pictures, 100. Yeah. Oh, that's so bad. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So speaking of, of challenges, <laughs> I, I was curious, apart from, you know, your film getting destroyed by x-rays, that's insane. What are some of the challenges that you faced as a young artist just in, in the industry, just being a young person? I'm sure there's nobody a lot. Nobody takes you serious. Yeah. Like nobody. <laughs> And um, this year I decided to start my professional career because I turned 18. I tried to do it before, but every time I got through in a contest, they, uh, I was uh, at the final moment. So I, I was one of the finalists. They, they did not include, but they discluded me. Like they, uh, they put me off the context a contest because I was under 18. They didn't mention that in the submission policy guidelines, but they just put me off, etc. And that was a lot of po- times that that happened. So when I was 18, when I just turned 18, I was like, now it's time to work. So <laughs> I wrote a lot of gallery submissions, a lot of contest submissions, like a lot of things that I did past year uh, because I just turned eight, 19 in, the, in December, also in December. <laughs> and um, What day? 26. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm the first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wrote a lot of uh, emails. I wrote a lot of like submissions. A lo- like I counted them several months ago for a submission at the university because I had to make a video about the industry, but it was like hundreds, literally hundreds. And people do not take you seriously. So um I had I I, because at high school I was working on my final uh, projects, that was a photography book, my art teacher and mentor, she encouraged me to publish it, actually publish it. And I got several connections from her with publishers. I wrote myself to publish it. And the way they treated me is horrible. When I look back now, I was like, oh my God, because... Um, at one stage, I was uh, actually speaking with somebody from the publishing house and I saw, I literally saw like this amount of cash in front of me because they wanted to buy my authorship for the book. And I was like, yes, yes, please. Like, give me the money. You can have it. You can have my whole career. And I we, we literally discussed this contract signing and it took a long time because firstly, they ignored me through email for three months. 
after they invited me for this contract signing kind of discussion. And we like, it was almost agreed. And that guy, he was like, we will email you in August. You will have the money. Like we will do it. You will be a pop star, etc. cetera. And um, in September, <laughs> they still didn't email me back. So I called him and he had uh, my dummies, my actually triprints for the book. And the book is actually almost ready. So it's o- it only needs an investor or a publisher or somebody to finance it. Because I, I, I if I finance it myself, it will not... I can do that, but it will be like 50 books lying in my bedroom and I do not know how to distribute it. So it needs a publisher or an investor with distribution connections. And in September, I called him and I was like, hi, like w- w- when we w- we are signing, I'm just wondering like, and he was like, oh, we decided that we are not a photography publishing house. Like it took like nine months of discussion that we actually discussed, and he was like, "No, we are actually we, we don't ha- we we don't know. Like we are not a photography publishing house. You can have your book back, send it back." And I was like, "Oh my god!" And there were a lot of situations like galleries that do not take you serious. Still, when I email a gallery and I'm putting, it's a really polite email, maximum of politeness with CV, with everything, like. It's, it's like, like like a job interview you email to them. And the, the way that they treat you, because a lot of galleries are made by people who are who not, did not get into the art industry that they wanted to be in. So they created a gallery to disclude other people from it. So um, when you email a gallery, they do not answer you. So they are like, we will ignore you for several period of time. And... Then I call them in a month to say, hi, did you receive my email? I really want to work with you. Did you like, and they're like, yes, we received it. We will work on it. We are actually discussing you this week. So it's okay. We want to work with you. It's nice. And I'm okay. (sighs) Two weeks later, I call them again and they're like, yes, yes, we are doing our job. Great. And in like, in several months that I tried to call them, they are like, yes, we are working on you. We want to work with you, but like for like we are waiting and we do not like that you are calling that much etc so they are trying to convince you that they want to work with you but they do not want to like get you like that kind of stuff so sometimes a gallery just immediately says no, says no and that's the best thing that you can do and sometimes they are like sometimes you are like food that they want to see on the day but the other day they do not want to work with you etc so they are keeping you on the uptight because then you cannot apply to another gallery because you have almost a connection with this one but at the end they say like hmm we discussed it but we do not want actually and we want to wait and we will like that stuff what you hear on a job interview that we will call you back so that kind of things and Mostly, it starts when you say your age. So um, when you email them, they are like, whoa, we want to sell it. Whoa, we, we, we like your CV. You, you participated in this. You sold that. You did that. And when it comes to contract signing, they're like, you were born in, 20, in 2003. Like, you are 19. And I'm like, yes. And they're like, oh. Then it's another story. So then they think that you did not have the time to put enough effort in your art. And then they think that you are not a professional because you're young or because like they think that you will be a concurrent for them at some point. Yeah. It's horrible. And that's why I applied to an art university. And that was one of the most horrible decisions in my life. <laughs> when I applied, um, when I decided to apply to an art uni, actually, I was... 17, 16, like when the decision was made, I was 17. And I did that because I really enjoyed my uh, like time at the Amsterdam Photography Academy. It was great. I had like the, the most cool times were there because I was studying with older people. I was 15 that time. I really enjoyed that. And I wanted to continue to learn that way. And I did a lot of masterclasses and workshop with a lot of uh, photography processes like Sienna type or Collodion prints or whatever. And I really enjoyed that because I worked with the photographer himself and he was explaining it to me. And it's like, 
um, it's like going like visiting your grandparents when they when they actually learn you something when you're a child like cooking like grandmother learned me to cook uh, dumplings for example the same was with the photography workshops that somebody from an older age with a lot of experience can tell me how to do something i really enjoyed that and Currently, I'm studying at the University of Arts in London at the Photography Bachelor Program. When I heard about this university, that their main focus is art and that they are really rich and big and in London and in England, that was like, yes, I think that's it for me. Because on their website, they promoted it as we can learn you how to make money from your art. But what I didn't see is the price tag of this slogan. We, we will teach you. <laughs> how to make money with your art because the price to study there for a home student from England or Europe at that time is 10,000 pounds but for an international student from like overseas 30,000 pounds at that time there was no Brexit so um, when I decided to say to my parents like mom dad I like that university my parents really wanted to me to study in England or America but they preferred England and there was one moment when we actually were discussing, like, will it be Cambridge or Harvard? I was really good in school. Like, for, for a time, I was really, go really good. And I was actually, at some point, I was actually believing that I will study, like, in Cambridge. So, uh, like, it will, it will be finance or economics in Cambridge or law or something like that. And then I discovered that I can actually study art. And I gave up all my students' school grades, etc., so I thought like it will be art because it's possible. And we had the financial possibility for art at that time. So my parents were like, okay, we don't like this idea, but it's your thing, go for it. And when applying to this university, they promote it as really hard that only 1% of the students can get into. So 10,000 of applications, five get in. And because of that, it was like a year and a half that I was preparing to with my portfolio. and. I really love my parents because uh, my father, they were rebuilding the living room that time and they had a big, big wall, white wall that my father said, like, if you want to like draw stuff here, you can do this because like we, we will paint it, but you can use it for your art if that's needed. And I put my portfolio on that big wall and just I was preparing my process, portfolio, everything. But it, it took a long time and I was actually worried that I will not get in, etc. But I got in. I was really happy. The Brexit came. The price raised three times for me. Because I'm from the Netherlands, I also cannot apply for a grant. Because if you are from a wealthy Western European country, you cannot apply for a grant. If you are from, like, say, Latvia, you can apply. But if you're from the Netherlands, it doesn't matter how much money your family makes or you make. You cannot apply for a grant. You are just from Western Europe. You need to pay the overseas fee because you can, because we think you can. So when I got to the university, uh, I was really depressed because uh, the things that I've, spe I've expected, the learning program that they promoted, it wasn't there. So the first thing that scared me in August that year, because the, the journey started in September at the uni, in in May, I was accepted. In August, I started worrying because I did not hear anything from the university and I had to make uh, a CAS document that actually can make you a visa, etc. And just like finding a house to live in or getting a student accommodation, something like that. It started then because the university didn't do anything because vacation. But a lot of, a lot of English universities didn't work then. So I didn't know that. For me, it was a bit like, hmm. Because in Amsterdam, they started actually at the end of August. So when my friends started the, their universities in Amsterdam, mine was still like, it's still like, we don't know. And when I started, uh, we had only three days a week lessons. And the first month, it was really introductional. So uh, for me, I traveled from my home in, in London to this university. It's like an hour and a half to get to. And when I arrived... We only had like a half hour coffee break to discuss how cool we are because we make art. And then I went back three, three days a week. And I didn't, I didn't write myself in for that. So I really was expecting a hard training program that I worked for that hard because I was really expecting the workshops and everything. And it, it wasn't there. So 
after like some months i was i was really depressed because it wasn't what i expected and it wasn't also the like the program i at some workshops that we had we had workshops uh, they weren't well prepared because the teachers they sometimes they didn't they also didn't know how to prepare a workshop or how to tell what they are doing and sometimes the teachers they were just like we are we are just mad that we have to tell this five days a week to different people so um it it, it wasn't working and uh, at some point i just didn't show up for the lessons and also what i didn't notice then but now i see the schedule for that time that also the lessons days they got like they got away so instead of three days at the beginning of september october november it went to two days then we had a really long holiday like a month and a half it's not normal for a holiday at university where you are even not studying actually uh then we got to up to two days a week now we have one day a week that's a guest lecture that you can watch online so you don't have to be at the university so I I do not know what happened because I've talked to a lot of students who are also amazing people, but they are also like, we didn't expect this. We we also wrote ourselves up for a university program of five working days. We are at the university just to drink coffee. And a lot of things at the university were like not for me because I'm not like an influencer kind of person. Last week, I needed to print a project at the printing room and there was a big row of people waiting and you can actually use the printing room yourself if you have used the machines before and if somebody explained it to you but i had to make holes in paper in a small like it's just like two holes for binding a book and it's not that much but you have to do the smart intro the 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 small introduction for making that yourself and i didn't do that so i needed to wait to use that machine for somebody to explain to me and there were a lot of girls who went there only to make like their Instagram feed look creative because there was a guy who is an expert in printing and he is trying to explain to them like you should cut the paper with this machine like this. You should use this, this machine like this. The only thing that they did was filming how that guy was printing for them and making holes for them, etc. Just to make look for their Instagram stories that they are creative and they use it. And how cool is this? And that guy he got annoyed of course because he was all constantly filmed just because like he is the expert etc and because of that a lot of people were waiting there etc and i do not like that those kind of people that only want to make your instagram like make their instagram feed look creative etc so i got really annoyed by that and mostly people are, the, are like that at the uni mostly i i, I like this so next year i will quit and i will go to amsterdam back because i didn't like london it was too big for me i'm like used to uh, to amsterdam it's a small village you can get everywhere in 40 minutes maximum with a bike 40 minutes you can like walk around the town in 40 minutes in london you can like travel 40 minutes to the nearby subway metro station over underground overground and for me, that's the case, because in London, I live not near an overground or underground. For me, it's 40 minutes with the bus to get there and then I can travel. So uh, I'm also a bit annoyed by London and just a big city. I'm used to a smaller one and I will move back to Amsterdam and just study here something that I can actually use, like business management, for example, or economics. And I'm I'm just really sad about that nobody told me that Art Uni could be like this. And it's not for everyone. Because the only thing that I saw on the internet was that they are drinking coffee at uni. And for me, that was so cool. Like drinking coffee at uni. And that was like the only thing I looked for, I think. I don't know. But the thing that I saw on the internet that everybody was so obsessed with UIL is actually a really popular university on Instagram, TikTok and everywhere. And like fashion etc the only thing that i didn't like look for then i didn't see like their actual study program it wasn't there but actually the study program isn't there because of this so i'm really disappointed at this but i i encourage people to start and study art 
but not in the way that they do not want. So if you are studying art at a university that you do not like or at an academy that you do not like, you can every time you can quit and you can find something else that can help to improve your artistic like journey it doesn't have to be something related to arts directly like studying uh, sketches or studying photography it can be something like management because all those disciplines are related to your art practice and you can actually use that absolutely so i i don't know there's probably a lot of uh cultural differences um but in in america where i'm in florida actually <laughs> so we i didn't go to art school and i completely wholeheartedly agree with everything you're saying i don't think it's for everyone in fact i feel like most of my friends who did go to art school and have graduated recently i do feel like a lot of them really regret going not all of them some of them feel like it was really helpful and good for them if it was but again like everywhere almost everywhere in the entire world art Art schools are so much more expensive than just regular schools, especially, I'm, I mean, in America, college is just insanely expensive for everyone, mm -hmm. <laughs> but art school is specifically more. I, uh, when I was in high school, I wanted to go to this college called Ringling College of Art and Design. It was like my whole dream. And I got accepted with a scholarship and the scholarship was for $80,000. And after my scholarship was subtracted from my total, after all four years, I would still have to pay uh, $175,000, like around oh my there. God. Yeah. And I didn't have anybody to like co-sign a loan for me or anything like that. And because of my like financial aid requests, like it got denied. So I would have had to get private loans. And so I just decided, you know what, like, it can't be worth that price. Like I could buy a house with that amount of money. It's like the equivalent of like a small three bedroom. Well, at the time that I was starting, not so much anymore, because the cost of housing here has tripled in the last four years. But at the time in 2017, 2018, that was the the cost of like a small, modest three bedroom, two bathroom, single family home. So I was like, there's no way that this is worth it. Uh, so I just went to a community college. And I 100%, I think you're right. I feel like if you're an artist, and you're thinking about going to art school, uh, if you have to take out loans, like if you have rich parents, do whatever you want. But if you have to take out huge loans, I would definitely look into like a either like a community college that's significantly cheaper or like a regular university for, like you said, either business or I would also put marketing on the table as well, because marketing is super important for art. I think those degrees will give you more skills for actually making your career as an artist successful than going to art school. Because if you're already an artist and you know you already do good work because like you've been, you have had solo exhibitions, you've, you know, you've been published, like you know that you do good work. If you already are doing good work and you don't feel like you need to learn more art skills specifically, business and in marketing, I think will be a lot more helpful. So I definitely agree with what you said. We are almost 10 minutes over an hour though. So I do want to wrap it up. But I, I do have one last question for you before we wrap it up. This will just be a longer episode, which is fine. <laughs> but my question for you is, uh, what advice would you give your younger self regarding your art career? Is, is there anything that you wish you would have done differently? Don't delete your YouTube channel. It will be useful. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of was thinking that you might say something like that. I agree. If you're if you're like a younger, I don't think we have very many young people listen to art wise. I think like, well, not young. Most. OK, let me reword that. Every almost everyone, like 75 percent of people who listen to this podcast are like between the ages of like 18 and 30. But under 17 is like one percent of our audience. But if you are under 17 and you're in like middle and high school, don't delete stuff. Just make it <laughs> private. <laughs> Just make it private so that no one can see it. Don't delete it. 
because you might want to look at it. <laughs> that's that. That's what I would say. If you yes. think you're going to get bullied, just make it private. And <laughs> honestly, I mean, I know it's traumatic getting bull- like it sucks. I get it. But like, just make it private. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Toma, for coming on. I'm going to go ahead and Thank let you, you. do your, your self-promo um, before we wrap up the episode. So um, anywhere that people can find your work, see your work, purchase from you, um, go ahead. Like the floor, the floor is all yours. <laughs> you can find me on Instagram. My handle is T-O-M-A-F-O-T-O-G-R-A-A-F, Toma Photograph. It's, it's, it's a Dutch word for Toma and photographer. So Toma Photograph. You pronounce it in Dutch, but people cannot pronounce it in the Dutch way. Like nobody could. It's always Toma Fotogur. So in Dutch, it's Toma photo, photo, Photograph. In English, it's Toma Photograph. So uh, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok. It's the same handle. And yeah, you can see my pictures there, my artworks and everything I work on now. All right. Is there anything you wanted to add before we wrap up the episode? Don't delete your YouTube channels. <laughs> <laughs> I have I agree with that one. All right, Toma, thank you so much for coming on. This was an amazing thank episode. You. I can't wait for it to come out. And thank you to everyone who listened this far. As always, um, we have Artwise merch. We have a Patreon. All of that um, is linked on our Instagram at Artwise Podcast. And also five stars on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and a like on YouTube really helps us out. So that's it for this episode. <laughs> But I will see all of you again next Tuesday. Bye, everyone.